But with that, welcome to 412 again. Uh, let's pray and get into God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly we are grateful, we are thankful for the opportunity to come before you and just to, to gather together, to grow in your word and truly see the things that you have for us, Lord. As we dig in and we grow, we get to learn and we get to understand who you are and the relationship that you want to have with each and every one of us, Lord. So we thank you for that. We thank you for the opportunity to have a place to come into. We just pray right now that you would just continue to lead us and guide us and uh, give us eyes to be able to see um, the truths that you would have for us, especially as we dig into Psalms and just seeing Jesus in the Psalms, Lord. And we just pray for our hearts and our minds to be right. And we just, uh, again, thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So we've been traveling through the Psalms, looking at uh, some different ones uh, in the series, Seeing Jesus in the Psalms. So far, we've looked at Psalms 110, Psalms 1, Psalms 23. Last week, we looked at Psalms 98. Today, we're going to be jumping over to Psalms 118. Um, it's probably the largest of the Psalms that we will look at in this series. We got one more next week. Um, in that regard, this Psalm does have a title in the passage, but it doesn't have an author. For the psalm, which isn't not isn't is isn't is not interesting, is not an off whatever. It's not uncommon. A lot of the psalms don't have authors. Again, people like to speculate who wrote it because we like to be nosy and think we know things correct. So on that note, uh, many assume that King David wrote this psalm. King David wrote many of the psalms in the Book of Psalms. Uh, this one, they assumed that he wrote it based upon the style of writing and the different things that were said. But where they get their truer fact that they lean towards David being the author of Psalm 118 is because of what's said in Ezra chapter 3. And in Ezra chapter 3, it suggests that they sang Psalm 118 as they um, did the founding of the second temple. So remember how the Israelites went out, they were taken in exile, they came back, they rebuilt the temple with Ezra. When they rebuilt the temple and they got everything good, they kind of did a whole founding thing. They sung this Psalm 118, or as it says in Ezra chapter 3, verse 10, according to the ordinance of da uh, David, king of Israel. So they're associating that David wrote this Psalm, which is all right, we can go with that, no problem there. But there's some more to this psalm than just simply the fact that David wrote it and what has gone on was going on in the psalm. Psalm 118 is actually another interesting fact about it is it's a collection of six psalms that were sung and go with the idea of the Egyptian Hallel psalms. So these psalms all pertain to the Exodus and the Israelites coming out of the Exodus and remembering what God had done for them. So much to the fact that like this psalm and the other five psalms that go along with this, Psalms 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, and 118, these were all sung in Jesus' day at a time as they celebrated Passover and also the Feast of Tabernacles. Both in Matthew chapter 26 and Mark 14 tell us that Jesus sang a hymn with his disciples at the Last Supper as Jesus sang the words, For his mercy endures forever. He did this in complete knowledge and understanding that the endurance of God's mercy that would be tested on him and through him that night and the next day that he went to the cross. So this psalm was sung the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before that awful false trial, and before he went to the cross at the supper that he had with the guys, which was on Passover. So this is a Passover hymn that was done. So as we look at Psalms 198 and seeing Jesus in the Psalms, the title of the message is Chief Cornerstone, Jesus. Now with that, typically I've been kind of building up as we've worked through the Psalms um, to the point of seeing who we're seeing as far as Jesus in the Psalm. With this one, I'm going to do a little backwards and give the importance here of understanding that Jesus is our chief cornerstone. We've seen already how it's being portrayed in the work of it that this is a key factor to know ahead of time as we dive into this Psalm. We're not just going to get to it, and I'm not going to build up and get you there, but we're knowing this ahead of time. Why? It's more fun to know stuff ahead of time, is it not? Okay, some of you agree. So with that, we're going to read the entire psalm. Like I said, it's 29 verses, and the reason we're going to read the entire psalm is because this is a song. And I don't know about you, but have you ever tried to listen to a song when someone stops it in the middle and then attempts to explain something to you? 
and then they, they start it up again, and you're like, all right, and then they stop it again in the middle, and you're like, can you just let the song play out? Or in my case, you get bored with the song, so you change it. We're going to look at the whole psalm. We're going to read through it, and then we're going to go back and take it apart. Also on that note, um, as you look in your Bibles and you see Psalms 118, you'll notice that there's some italicized words. The reason that the words are italicized is these words were added in after the fact. Basically what it was is when this song was written in the Hebrew language, there wasn't a phrase or a word for these words. Honestly, you could admit these words and the psalm would still sing or read perfectly fine. They added them in for um, just to drive the point of what's taking place, all right? So we're going to read it all, all 29 verses here. Picking up in verse 1 of Psalms 118, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. In verse 5, it says, I called to the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. For the Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. All nations surround me, but in the, middle of, in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surround me, yes, they surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surround me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. In verse 15, we continue, and it says, The voice of the righteous and self." The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the terms of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord is... Vil- I blinked. Valiantly. Valiantly. That's it. <laughs> valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but ha- he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them, and I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. Verse 21, I will praise you, and you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is what the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day of the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cord to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. And he concludes in verse 29, much as he started, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Here we see this psalm that's played out. We're going to look at it in three different parts. The first part that we see is the first four verses, roughly, as a call to worship. It opens with the line, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. But along with this being the opening verse, this is also the closing verse. And these two verses truly bookmark this psalm in setting what is taking place and how great our Lord is. And the fact that we are to do what? But to give thanks to the Lord because he is good and his mercy endures forever. These opening words are familiar as well as a reminder that God's goodness can be enjoyed every day because of God's love that he has for each and every one of us. As the writer then makes a call to call certain folks in to join in in this chorus, he calls first on who? The, the land of Israel. He calls on the priests of the house of Aaron and even those, what's it say there in verse, the verse 4? Those who fear the Lord now say. Three groups that he calls on. First, he calls on the chosen ones of Israel, God's people, the Israelites, to call and to sing of God's mercies. 
Then he calls on the priest. Just to put a note in there, at this point in time, the priest of the house of Aaron, there was kind of a strife between them and Israel right now because um, when David was, wrote this and it took place, so he was trying to call for the unity, not just of the people, but the religious leaders as well to sing. And then it's this other group. This other group truly is anyone who calls on the Lord and comes to him for refuge, which is, gives us the insight that he's saying that those that may not even be Jews, the Gentiles, are to call and to sing making it this great chorus of those that would be singing and um, praising the Lord for what he does and his mercy that is enduring forever. We're called to worship. He calls basically all those who lean on God, find refuge and peace in God, to sing of his mercy that comes each and every day. So we see the call to worship, but then we transition over into a testimony of his mercy. And this is verses 5 through 21. It's a larger um, chunk here, but with this, we also see another aspect of the psalm. Many of the psalms are written, they're lament songs where it's like the woe is me kind of psalms, right? Then there's the praise songs, much how this one started. But there's also the psalms that, that call out with the idea of calling out in trouble and hearing God answer to them. And this is also one of those psalms where it's the call out and to hear the response of God. Because what does he say there? He called out of distress, and the Lord heard my call. And they responded. And what did he do? The response was what? To put him in a safe place. To bring him out of harm's way. The psalmist is letting us know that it doesn't matter who the person is. If it's a king, or if it's a regular person. If it's a Jew, if it's a priest, a religious leader, a leader in the community. If it's a Gentile, whoever it is, if they call on the Lord, he will respond. And he will answer their call in a time of distress. But we have to realize here is, when do we call upon the Lord? Oftentimes is when we're in our distress, is the first person we call God? Or do we try to figure it out for ourselves? We try to figure it out for ourselves, right? And when that fails, what do we do? Do we call God? No, we call a friend. And when that doesn't work out, what do we do? We call another friend. Suddenly, somewhere along the way, what does someone say? Have you prayed about it? Unfortunately, so many times, our first response isn't to call God. It's our last resort that we call on the Lord. What the psalmist is trying to remind us here is our last resort should be our first priority. Our first priority when we're in trouble is, should be to call on the Lord and to see what he can do, not what we can do. The passage carries on to remind us that the Lord is always with us. He's standing by our side, it says there in the passage. And with him standing by our side, truly we have nothing to fear. This is like the idea of the little brother and the big brother. The little brother can feel way more confident in life when the big brother is standing beside him, right? Because so often he has strength from the big brother. The same goes with God. When God is standing next to us, we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to be scared because who is there but God? And God is our strength, as we're going to see in this. But notice what it says here. It nowhere says that you're going to have a very nice and peaceful life. Nowhere does it say that it's not going to be a struggle and hard times are going to come upon us. He reminds us that we are going to have our challenges. But with God next to us, we have nothing to fear. Or we could follow the words that, Psalm encur or that Paul encouraged us in Romans 8, verse 31, when he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Paul echoed the words of the psalmist here, and he encourages us that we have nothing to fear, and even to the point that we have nothing to fear of those that even hate us, because we have the strength and we have our God on our side. Building upon this, we're encouraged and we're reminded that if we trust in him, we have more benefits than if we trust in our own standings. But even better than that, he tells us, we don't need to trust in man. And he doesn't just say simply, don't trust man. He listed out the fact of, don't trust common man, but don't even put your trust in religious or leaders of men. Because they're going to let you down. Truly, the struggle that we often have is, we put our trust in man, when unfortunately we should be putting our trust in the son of man. Because so we put our trust in the son of man, what we get from that is way better than anything that we can acquire from a friend or someone that we look to or a person in a position of power. We have to remember, it's not trusting man, but trusting the son of man. And think about the trust that we get when we trust Jesus. 
When we trust Jesus, Jesus' help is wiser than what man would give us. When we trust Jesus, Jesus' help is better morally than what man would offer us. Jesus' help is also safer. Jesus' help is in its direction, lifting us up instead of tearing us down. And truly, when we trust in Jesus, we can see that Jesus' help has a better outcome because it's looking out for our better need than the other person's needs. He tells us and encourages us not to look at man, but to look at the Son of Man for the encouragement that we have. Jesus knows us, and he has the best interest for us. As it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, and this is the ESV version, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. If we trust in Jesus, Jesus knows what we're going through. He knows the things that we need, the tools, the resources, and he understands that we're going to make mistakes. We're not going to fully listen to him because why? We trust ourselves versus trusting him. But he does have our best interests. And because of this, there is no reason to not trust him. Continuing in this section here, we come to verse 10, and we see that the psalmist is in trouble. And the trouble is not a little trouble. He has like the nations coming after him and he compares it to the fact of a swarming bees. I mean, we could all handle one bee, right? You flick it away and you're good, right? But a swarm of bees? Think about it, man. Has anybody ever had to face off a swarm of bees? It's not fun, all right? Because it's bad enough that if you flick one away and do it, if it gets close enough to you, it sprays this little um, hormone on you, that you know what that does? It attracts other bees. So now you think you could run away from something that you can't run away from. Problems do arise, and unfortunately, problems that we face in life are bigger than what we think they are and bigger than what we can handle. And we have to understand that it's not about what we can do, but about what the Lord can do for us. And he's going to care, and he's going to protect us, and he's going to put us in a safe place so that we can do what, as the psalmist says here, we can sing of the strength of the Lord. We've been looking at these psalms. These psalms last week remind us that we sing of the victories that we have in Christ. We sing of his strengths and the victories that we have in him. We have to look to the Lord for our strength and our refuge. The question is, when do we do that? Again, is it a first resort or a last resort? Do we come to him for help or do we run away from him? As Jesus sang these words that night, again, coming back to the fact that we talked about this psalm was sung the night of of the Passover, the night of his betrayal, The night that Jesus sang these words with his disciples, he knew that only a few hours later he would truly be surrounded by those who would be mocking him, torturing him, and wanting him killed. With no doubt, a multitude of nations surrounded him, but he was able to say as he sang this psalm, salvation is of the Lord. So what do we do? We understand that salvation is of the Lord. And the psalmist here is encouraging us to do what? Sing of the joy of the victories that we have in the Lord. And again, this is one of the psalms that was sung at that Seder dinner, the feast. And remember, Passover feast is celebrated for what? The victory they had over their enslavement in Egypt. Coming out of Egypt. The ten plagues, the river, all the things. This meal, Passover, was to do what? Remind them of what God did for them. The Feast of Tabernacles is the same intense. It's to remind them, again, what God had done for them. We sing of the victories we have in the salvation of the Lord and the work of His right hand, His strength. Yes, commonly most people are right-handed, right? And most people have more strength than their right hand. But where do we know, who do we know that sits at the right hand of God? Jesus. And He is the one that is exhibiting the skills and the direction that he has for each and every one of us. As a result, we see here that the Lord, the psalmist writes, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The psalmist was confident that God would keep him from death, even in his present circumstances. And I know sometimes when we face the trials and we face these situations, we think the most inevitable, we're going to die. This is the worst thing that we've ever gone through. We're going to die. But when we trust in God, we know that God's going to carry us through. We're not going to die. It's probably not that bad. 
but we've assumed the worst because we feel that it is the worst, remembering that where we've put our trust, and that our trust is no longer in our Savior. And we come back again to that night that Jesus sang this song with his disciples at the Last Supper. He would have proclaimed confidently that death would not keep a hold on him, but he would live and declare the works of the Lord. We can see that the psalmist saw the victory over death. Though we have victory over death because of our Savior, there's still some work that has to be done in each and every one of us, right? When we come to Christ, we're justified, we're made clean and made right, but then there's the salvation process, the sanctification process. And we all love the sanctification process, right? Because we think we're good until that one thing happens, and then we're not so good. And then God's got to work on us, and he grinds away at it. And in doing so, there's correction that needs to be done. And the psalmist points out here that though things could have gone worse, the correction that's given to me is needed for me to be sanctified and to become closer to who God would have me to be. And yes, someday, hopefully soon, we get to go to heaven. We won't have to worry about sin anymore. We'll reach the ultimate perfected state. And guess what? None of this will matter. We'll look back and be like, wow, we were really stupid that one time. Why did I not just do what God wanted me to do? We're not there yet, so you still have some time to look through those. And all this, it comes about... And it's on the cross that Jesus faced the chastening or judgment for our sins. But we were able to have victory over death because he had victory over death. And we can claim that reward because of what he has done for us, that day of salvation. And the passage here in this section concludes in verses 19 through 21. Jesus led the way with the victory over the cross. He opened the way for us going into heaven, opening the gates of righteousness so that we could come and follow behind him in those steps. But know this, there's a catch about who can enter those gates. The gates aren't open to anybody. They're only open for the righteous, which means you have to have him as your savior in order to get through the gates. So the gates to protect heaven are watching over. So it lets us know that we have to be in the right place with the right mindset and come to him as Lord and Savior and understand the work of the cross, that day of salvation, so that we can enter in to the gates. And when we enter into those gates, we come into heaven, we'll be there as the call to worship originally started with everybody doing what? Praising the Lord and God for the work that he has done. And we can sing how great is our Lord. The last section of this psalm is the chief cornerstone. It said there in verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. To be honest, it's kind of like you'd like an insight right here. Like why did the psalmist write this this way? What did the psalmist know? Because the words here that the psalmist writes, these truly are a prophetic statement. Which as much as this is a psalm of calling out and hearing a response from the Lord, this is also a prophetic psalm. Because of what it's pointing to. Because it is certainly was fulfilled in the work of Jesus. Now with that being said, there's a strong important statement in the New Testament that's repeated several times is verse 22 here. The stone which the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Jesus quoted this of himself in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 12, and Luke chapter 20 of the Gospels about himself. Peter quoted this in reference to Jesus in Acts chapter 4 verse 11. Paul alluded to the same verse in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20. And Peter also referred to it again in his book, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 7 through 8. This is, again, one of the most commonly quoted Old Testament verses that points to our Savior and how he would be rejected by man but become the chief cornerstone. And the problem that lies out here is why was he rejected? Well, this comes down to the religious leaders. The religious leaders had a mold. They had a standard. They had a thing that had to be kept. And guess what? Jesus didn't check the boxes. They had some problems with him. And what did they reject? Well, 
They didn't approve of his origin. As it says in John chapter 7, verse 52, beginning with the religious leaders, they said to him, being Jesus, are you from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. They didn't accept him because of where he came from. They also rejected him and didn't approve of him because of his lack of formal education found in John chapter 7 verse 15 because they were marveled over the fact that he had never studied but yet he knew the letters. They didn't approve of his disregard for religious traditions as it says in Luke chapter 2 or 6 verse 2 and really the Pharisees came at him and were upset because he didn't follow the laws and we're not talking about the original 10 commandments it's the 613 other laws. He didn't keep them and it upset them. And lastly, they didn't approve of Jesus because of his choice of friends. Or as it says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? This is why they rejected Jesus. They rejected the stone that would become the chief cornerstone. Despite the religious leaders, God established Jesus as the chief cornerstone of his great plan of the ages, and all things would be founded and fulfilled in him, even though they rejected him. To understand this, a, a cornerstone, uh, what a cornerstone is, a cornerstone is the capstone was an important stone that held two rows of stone together in a quarter, hence a cornerstone. So on a foundational plane, there was this one stone that was larger and done just right that would lock in all the other stones, in a sense, bringing a solid form base of a structure. Jesus is this cornerstone. Jesus is the bond of the building, holding Jews and Gentile in firm unity. But he's more than just holding that in firm unity. The precious cornerstone binds God with man together in harmony. So yes, he may bring men of mixed groups together. He also creates unity for us and God so that we can have a relationship with him. Going again back to that night, it's hard to imagine Jesus singing that night before his great rejection leading to his suffering and the crucifixion without tears in his eyes. He would be rejected, but yet he would still become the chief cornerstone. And it was God only who paved the way for this to happen. No man could take credit for it. Only God could have allowed for Jesus to go to the cross, to be resurrected from the dead, and to be from the resurrection, to sit at the right hand of the Father. Only God could have done this. No man, no person on earth could have arranged for these things to take place. And this is the marvelous event indeed that we are called to worship and to praise God for. Jesus suffered in his rejection by man, but the Father demonstrated his acceptance of the Son by making him the chief cornerstone. And in this we rejoice and we give thanksgiving of what the Lord has done on the day of salvation. Jesus is, was quoted and saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And in light of this, the phrase, this is of Hosanna. So not only do we see him praising God or stepping out in these praises, if we jump back to a week before on Palm Sunday, as he entered in to the city on the donkey's back, what did the people cry? Hosanna, Hosanna, save me. He rode in as the king of Israel. He died as the king of of Israel, the Messiah. And every day after that, we come to Christ as our Savior. We choose to pick up our cross and follow after him. It gives us the opportunity to rejoice and to be glad in the day that the Lord has made for each and every one of us. For each day, we should be praising God for the work that he's done and allowing us to follow him. God is the Lord. This statement is so much truth of who God is, but it goes on to say that he gives us light because without him, we have nothing. And in this dark world, we need a light. We need to be able to see in the way to go. Building upon it as the passage closes out, the psalmist makes a very profound statement 
in the final verses there saying, bind the sacrifice with cords to the horn of the altar. This would be placing the animal on the altar that would be sacrificed. But what the psalmist didn't know is that day of salvation, that day that Jesus went to the cross, he would go as a willing sacrifice to the cross for the people. And the magnitude of the statement that Jesus is going to the cross as our sacrifice is so deep and profound because it could not be understood. And even now we still wrestle with the fact of how could a man do what he has done for us? And knowing the fact that he went willingly to the cross. And the psalmist brings it to a conclusion there in verses 28 through 29 with leading the community in a praise of God alone and repeating how he opened the path of the song with closing the song, O oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. So what? Every time we come to the end or we come to the part, we ask the question, so what? We see that Christ is our cornerstone. He is our chief cornerstone. What he has done to bring unity between us and God, no man could do. What does that mean for each and every one of us? The question that I have for us is, where do we find our confidence? Now, with that being said, confidence is defined as a feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something. It's firm trust. The definition goes on to say, a feeling of self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities or qualities. I don't know about you, but there's not much I can do on my own. But there's a thing. Confidence can carry us in this life. If we have confidence, we can go forward because we have trust. We have an assurance, right? But as much as confidence can carry us, what can confidence do to us too? It can hurt us. It can destroy us. An overconfident person will head into life and they will be met with the most devastating destruction before them because of their confidence in themselves. But one puts their confidence not in themselves, as the definition says, but the first definition, putting our trust in another person, we put our trust in Christ, we get so much more than what we can even do for ourselves. And as a Christ follower, with looking and putting our trust in the chief cornerstone, we gain more than anything this life can have to offer to us. When we choose to put our trust in Jesus, we gain more things than this world will ever show us because of what he has for us. And looking at it this way, when we put our confidence or trust in Jesus, we gain strength, we gain a song, and we gain salvation. Again, we gain strength, a song, and salvation. You see, when we put our strength in Jesus, it means that, that he is our resource and our refuge. We look to him for our needs and we are never met unsatisfied because he gives us all that we need. We put our strength, or we, when Jesus is our song, it means that he is our joy and our happiness. We find our purpose and a life in him and we are never disappointed. We have victory in him and we can sing of the victories that he has. So we put our strength, uh, we see Jesus as our strength, we see Jesus as our song, and lastly, we see Jesus as salvation. It means that we put our trust and our help and our deliverance in none other than the one that can give us peace, the one that can guide us to those gates of righteousness, and the one who has made a way for us because he has conquered death, and truly we can rejoice in the salvation we have in him. When our confidence, our trust is in Jesus, the chief cornerstone, we are able to go through this life and know that the one who is guiding us is leading us to the best place ever, to the place beside our Father in heaven. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the fact that we have a chief cornerstone that is looking out for our best entrance and is guiding us to the best thing that we could ever see in this life, and that is life with you, Lord. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters as we go through the events of the week, the things that we have. If we find ourselves in trouble, Lord, that we would run to you and not try to do it ourselves, but we would trust in you. Lord, I pray too that if we're struggling with the different things that we have in our life, that we would see that truly the place that we will find peace is next to you and beside you because you have the best interest for us, Lord. Lord, we love you and thank you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.
Next week, Psalms 22. And I'll see you next week. That's all I got.